currently is working at the Academy of Sciences, and she is um, coordinates the program for uh, citizen science. And just a quick background on her: um, she got her bachelor's in biology at Swarthmore College. She got a master's in marine biology at Humboldt State. And in between doing those two, she taught outdoor education in the Santa Cruz Mountains for six years. Um, she also coordinated the Olympics, which is an acronym for Long-Term Monitoring Program and Experiential Training for Students. This took place at the Gulf of the Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary, and it was a near pedal monitoring project and students with citizen scientists. So without further ado, Allison. <laughs> Like the granddaddy of citizen science, like all citizen science kind of 
starts with them, it seems like. Um, and these are all the people who participate in that project. So you can see that they're gathering data across North America every year by involving the public in citizen science. Um, you can also gather data over a large temporal range, as well, so over a large time period. As long as the public is still interested, they'll keep sending you data. Believe me, I, tend, I still get data from long, you know, ended citizen science projects at the academy. Um, people just like to contribute. Um, there's other projects that really rely on human computation. So there's a number of citizen science projects out there that are online based, and they usually have people um, characterizing images, for example, or solving puzzles. So there's some things that the human brain is just better at doing than a computer. And some of that is, you know, being able to recognize, for example, the shape of galaxies, um, or solving how proteins hold. Um, so there's a lot of citizen science projects that do kind of this crowdsourcing thing um, where they use humans almost as computers. Um, you can address local concerns, and again, that kind of goes into those co-created projects where if you might have a question that your local community might be interested in helping you solve, especially if it has to do with um, pollution or environmental concerns, you can usually find people who are willing to help. Um, it has to do with their own community. And then there's the simple ep economics that there are a lot more non-scientists in the world than there are scientists. So by employing them to help them help you gather your data, um, you're automatically going to be able to gather much, much more than you usually could by yourself with a small scientific team. Um, and scientific teams are expensive. You know, if you were going to dispatch a scientific team or scientific teams to go watch all these feeders in the winter across North America, it's going to be a really expensive project. So volunteers tend to be a little bit cheaper. They are not free to. It tends to be a misconception that you have these free volunteers. It does take money to manage volunteers. That for sure. <laughs> um, and then there's just the idea of using what people call the cognitive surplus. And I love this image. So, this is the 200 billion hours that adults in the US spend watching TV every year. This is the 100 million hours it took people to create Wikipedia, which is like a crowdsourced project. So, we have what is called the cognitive surplus. There's a lot of extra time that people have that if you can get them excited and engaged about doing science or helping their local community, that you potentially have this huge resource that we can tap and engage people. So this is just a few examples of citizen science projects out there. And this is like a small drop of the ones that are out there. I tried to put ones up here that um, you here in the Bay Area can participate in. So these are either projects that are based here in the Bay Area, so they're local projects. Um, or their statewide or their nationwide projects where, you can, where they're gathering data across the state or across the nation, so you can participate that way. There's only a couple up here that um, you here in the Bay Area wouldn't actually be able to help contribute data towards. But you can see there's projects, you know, these ones up here are generally about marine things, marine animals, characterizing marine habitats, things like that. There's a couple like Project NOAA and iNaturalists that are involved in gathering just observations of the natural world. There are a whole lot of bird projects out there. I could have filled this whole thing with bird projects, just bird projects. Um, the ornithologist was really adapters of using citizen scientist data. Uh, these are a couple online puzzle solving games, Fold It and Eterna. They're both online, and they use the information that their participants provide um, in actual labs. There's a bunch of uh, insect uh, citizen science projects out there. You mentioned the Great Sunflower Project, um, and John, the Zombie Watch Project. Uh, there's a whole bunch of astronomy projects. These tend to be online astronomy projects. Mapper and QCN are geology projects. Here's a bunch of plant projects over here. Um, and then there's some environmental monitoring projects that are scattered throughout as well. So you can find you know, anything you might have an interest in, you could potentially become a citizen scientist for. There's lots and lots of projects out there. So what does citizen science accomplish? Generally, you can think about it as what are the participants getting out of it? And what are the researchers getting out of it? And a lot of times people feel like it's a one or the other. But if it's a well-designed project, they tend to be mutually beneficial. Um, so with the participants, we really tend to, tend to think about um, increasing science literacy in participants. You know, I think there's a, a general fear of science kind of in the world. A lot of people think, think, think of science as something that happens in a laboratory. People in lab coats has nothing to do with that. So that's kind of a disconnect right there. People don't see it as having anything to do with their kind of everyday lives. And so by getting people involved in science, it's something maybe they're already really interested in, like birds or plants or something like that, getting 
getting them out there and seeing how they can contribute to the scientific process, it not only creates scientific literacy, but it also just helps people feel a little bit more connected to science and how it might pertain to their own lives. Um, there's a lot of projects that show that people really start to have this critical thinking. You know, they start asking the questions the same way that a scientist would when they're out there and they're observing things. Um, they really start to kind of think in a scientific way as well. Um, and a lot of projects have documented kind of behavior change of their participants, where people, especially if they're engaged in ecology projects, that they might be having um, kind of conservation behavior changes as well that kind of just benefit the world as a whole. You know, if you get more into recycling or caring about invasive plants, you know, getting rid of them in your yard or something like that. Um, and then on the scientific side, I mean, these are all uh, studies that have documented these things. You can document range shifts, again, by collecting a whole lot of data over a large geographic scale. Um, you can identify vulnerable species. There are a lot of projects that have to do with like community health, um, like tracking the spread of diseases or things like that. Um, and then there's a lot of projects that uh, kind of are anticipating effects. They're monitoring right now to be able to um, detect changes in the future, like due to climate change or things like that, um, like effects on water sources, um, processing large image data sets. That gets back to the whole idea of humans as computers. This is a picture from Zooniverse for example, which Zooniverse, they started off with a couple million images from the Sloan Digital Telescope of galaxies. And they basically calculated, they actually had one like really dedicated grad student who like sat in his lab and basically characterized shapes of galaxies for days and days on end. So using that amount of time, it took him to classify, you know, like 50,000. They realized it was gonna take astronomers like about 200 years, I think, to go through and classify all those galaxies. So what they did instead is they decided to crowdsource it. They stuck it up online at this universe. Um, they got a whole bunch of people excited about participating. You know, they did a bunch of uh, kind of a PR about it. And I think within two months, they had over 100,000 users and they classified all like two million galaxies. So, so it's a way to you know, get a lot of information done really, really quickly. Um, and this idea also is applying human computation skills. Fold it is another great example. Fold it is an online protein folding, puzzle solving game, sort of. But the proteins that people are trying to figure out how the hell they fold are actual real proteins. Um, and within, I think, three or four months of Fold It being um, active and online, their participants discovered the uh, folding structure of a protein involved um, in combating AIDS. And it's a structure that scientists have been working on trying to figure out for years and years and years and have never come up with the right structure. But their participants really appeals to that gaming crowd worked on it and worked on it and actually discovered the, the correct folding structure. So you can get a lot of really good things by involving the public. So it also you can get peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, a lot of people worry about quality of data. If the project's designed well, you shouldn't have to worry about the quality of your data. Um, and so this is just a graph of uh, peer-reviewed journal articles that have the keyword citizen science in it. And you can see it's been around for a while, but especially in the last few years, there's been a huge upswing um, in articles that have used citizen scientists gathered data. Um, so this, again, talking about this being a really kind of new and exciting field, this really kind of illustrates that, that people are getting more and more excited and, and realizing the public is a really good resource. <coughs> um, and if you're interested in finding out more, there was just recently a special issue of Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, which was all about citizen science. And so I recommend you can read the whole thing online for free. It's a great way to just start. These are mostly ecology-based citizen science projects, but it's a great kind of primer to citizen science. So, moving away from what is citizen science, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing at the Academy with citizen science. So, um, my position at the Academy, citizen science educator is my title, um, didn't exist. There was no one with the word citizen science in their job title until I was hired a little over a year ago. And before, um, when I first started working at the Academy, we did have citizen science projects. We had a few projects. Um, they were largely um, observation gathering projects where people would send in photos of spiders or send in ants that Chris would identify for us. <laughs> um, but basically, we would take those observations and we would turn them into data by doing the identification ourselves. Um, but the, we were getting a lot back to our participants, and the projects also weren't very connected <coughs> in any way to each other. And we actually had a couple projects that we were gathering data for that the researchers who initially designed them weren't even using the data anymore. So there was this general feeling of 
This is not how we want to do citizen science. We don't know exactly what we want to do with citizen science, which is why my position was created to kind of help focus and think about um, creating a cohesive citizen science program at the academy. So the first thing that we had to do was we really had to focus our definition of what we wanted citizen science to be at the academy. You know, like I said, there's all these different projects out there. They all fall under this large umbrella of citizen science. But they're, they can be really different from each other. So we decided you know, we were going to come up with some goals for our citizen science projects, our brand of citizen science. Um, and those, when we came up with those goals, we realized that those were kind of going to define citizen science for us. So the first one is that we wanted anyone, any citizen science project that we had to be gathering data for a real research question at the academy. There are, there are citizen science projects that are mostly uh, for education benefits, where people are gathering data, they learn how to gather data, but the data aren't going anywhere. We really wanted to make sure that our data were going to be used. Um, we wanted to really have an impact on biodiversity, science literacy, and conservation. Any of you that have been to the academy know that those are three things we focus a lot on. So we wanted to make sure that we were having those sort of impacts. Um, we wanted to have a tiered involvement, which means that if people wanted to come out all day with us um, and collect plant specimens on Mount Tamalpais, they could. But if they only want to give us a half an hour, <coughs> that we still want to have ways that those people can contribute something meaningful um, to our citizen science projects. Um, and also the same idea with multiple entry points. Like I said, most projects are data gathering projects. We realized that our projects were going to be mainly data gathering, but we realized that not everyone wants to go out and gather data. Some people want to be more interested in analyzing data. Some people might want to help us come up with new questions. So we wanted to allow for those sort of opportunities to happen as well. Um, Engaging scientists and participants, and we should want to put beneficial work together. So we wanted to make sure that people are, you know, participants are feeling like they're getting something out of it, and the scientists are also feeling like they get it, that they're getting something out of it. Um, and then we're also really interested in just using technology in citizen science. How can people use smartphones or you know online databases for visualization or stuff like that um, in citizen science? And we were um, really lucky to have uh, our funder be the S.T. Bechtel Junior Foundation. Because most programs, when they want to start a citizen science project, they have to come up with an idea, and then they have to go find funding and say, hey, if you fund us, we're going to launch this project. It's going to be great. And that's how they get their funding. Um, we realized that we really needed to think a little bit more about what we wanted to do before we actually started launching something. Um, and luckily, the Bechtel Foundation realized that that would probably be a smart thing to let us really think critically about what we want to do. So we, uh, this whole year, all we've been doing is planning for citizen science. Uh, we have done so. Um, but basically what we, what we came up with is that we wanted to think about California biodiversity. You know, that's something that people in our area are interested in. Um, we have a lot of historical specimens from California. And this also kind of fills a niche for us too, because a lot of our researchers are interested in California biodiversity, but they work primarily someplace else, like in the Philippines or in Madagascar or in you know, South Africa or something like that. So this kind of helped us fill that niche as well. Like I said, we want to use our historical collections as a baseline. Uh, we want to define interesting locations where we have a lot of historical specimens and we say okay, that was that you know, these are species that used to occur there, maybe they still do occur there. So we want to take people out, go, and actually do um, kind of a new baseline in those areas that we can compare the two. Um, like I said, we didn't actually have to launch anything, but we figured it would probably be good if we tried a few things out. So we decided to do two test pieces, a terrestrial project and an intertidal project. And the idea behind this is we were going to try out protocols. We were going to test some tools to see how our volunteers liked them. We wanted to see what, what sort of volunteers were interested in helping us, things like that. Um, and then kind of separate from all of that, we also decided to hold a series of meetings to learn from other people. We figured there's a lot of people out there who've already done citizen science projects. They've probably made mistakes. Let's have them come and tell us what those mistakes were so we don't have to make them ourselves. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our test cases, and then I'll move into the, uh, a little bit about those meetings that we had. So our first test case, um, is up on Mount Tamil Pius. We're partnering with the Marin Municipal Water District. And the Water District um, has about 20,000 acres that they're in charge of managing on Mount Tamil Pius. And so they're managing basically for the quality of the water, but they also have to manage the landscape as well. Um, so this is actually a really great partnership. They kind of came to us and said, hey, this is our 100th year. This is their centennial anniversary. We want to do something kind of big and exciting. And what they realized would help them answer management questions was to get kind of a snapshot of the plant biodiversity in their watershed, where things occur, um, what species occur, where they are, things like that. 
Um, that was really all for us because we have a lot of historical specimens from Mount Temple Pius. We had a lot of curators early on in the academy who were interested in going over there and collecting plants. Um, but a lot of times, people would only collect kind of the really exciting, charismatic plants. They wouldn't collect the really common things or the things that were non-native. Um, so we have these gaps in our collections as well that we realize that we can fill by doing this with them. Um, their questions are a lot about invasives, about fire-associated species, because there's been a lot of fire suppression on Mount Tamapias. Um, and then again, uh, we both wanted to establish a benchmark. What's there now so that in the future we can continue to monitor and see how things might change um, going forward. So we've had four field days this year. We have ended our field season. Um, one of them, we had a woman from the West Virginia community radio station come out with us, and she actually made this really nice little radio sound bite slideshow that went with it. So I'm going to put that on and so you can kind of see what we were doing up on Mount Tam. This is Jacoba Charles, reporting for KWMR. A group of volunteers is gathered on a rocky, windswept outcrop high on Mount Tamalpais. We're part of a bioblitz hosted by the Marin Municipal Water District and the California Academy of Sciences in late June. What's the morning glory, Paul? It's LSDA, um, C-A-L-Y, S-T-E-G-I-A. Yeah. Just put an SP and we'll figure it out when we get back. During this day-long event, volunteers are sent out in teams to different parts of the mountain. Each group then spends several hours carefully cataloging every plant species they can find in a certain area. Is there more? That's the only one I've seen. Mount Tam is tremendously rich in terms of biodiversity. It's part of the Golden Gate Biosphere Reserve that was formed by UNESCO in 1988 to acknowledge the global significance of this place. Part of this diversity is because of the shape of the mountain. It rises steeply from the ocean to a height of more than 2,500 feet. Its sides are folded into deep shaded canyons and soaring exposed meadows. There are serpentine outcrops, stunted cypress forests, and oak woodlands. In a surprisingly short distance, the climate can change from wet to dry or from hot to cold. Because of its variability, this single mountain is home to 900 species of plants and at least 400 species of animals, plus many more organisms like bugs, fungi, or lichen. Of these species, 50 of the plants have special status designations, including seven that are listed by the federal or state government as rare, threatened, or endangered. The point of today's BioBlitz is to create a snapshot of the mountain's biodiversity at this particular moment in time. My team heads up to Rock Springs, where Pantole meets Rocky Ridge Road. There, we mark out our first circular plot and start searching for plants in bloom or in fruit. We document each one we find in many ways, with photos of the barium specimens, and we record the name, description, and location. In a wet meadow, we see elegant brodea, seep spring monkey flower, and resin weed. Okay, I've got multi gland. U L O S U M. Later, we move up to a serpentine knoll, looking out at the Pacific Ocean through gaps in the fog while we catalog Mount Tamalpais jewel flower, naked buckwheat, and golden yarrow. Overall, our team alone documented 22 species, from the rare to the invasive. Projects like the BioBlitz are also a way to involve interested locals in the scientific process, said Cal Academy organizer Allison Young. Having many hands on board let scientists gather more information and helps boost engagement by letting citizen scientists help with the process. For the West Marin Report, this is Jacoba Charles. Survey of the plants of Mount Tamalpais. 
Um, and like Jacoba was saying in her little radio blurb there, um, it, this is beneficial not only because you know we have historical collections there, and not only because <coughs> the water district has these management questions, but also because Mount Tamalpais really is an amazingly biodiverse area. It's a really unique location. Um, yeah, so, for example, 15% of California's flora is found in the watershed. The watershed is 1 100th percent of the area of California. So a lot of biodiversity in a small area. Um, and there's some endemic species um, from Marin, and many of them are actually found in the watershed as well. So it's another good, you know, we can answer kind of these larger biodiversity questions by working in a place like this. Our second test case was an intertidal test case down at the Florida <coughs> Reef. Um, and our partner here is the Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. So the sanctuary has over 200 miles of shoreline that they're responsible for. Very small staff, though. I used to work for them. So I know, very, very tiny staff. So they're really, really dependent on outside organizations or outside groups to help go and gather data and then, you know, report their results to the sanctuary so the sanctuary can make um, management decisions based on what the scientists are finding. Um, and again, this is an area, this is down on the San Mateo coast. We have a lot of historical specimens from this area, so we have kind of some past baseline that we can uh, compare what we're finding there currently. Um, pillar point though, no one, uh, it's one of the only unprotected rocky intertidal areas on the San Mateo coast. So there's no comprehensive species list from the area, so we're trying to kind of build that as we go out with our, with our volunteers. Um, and because it's an unprotected area, if you're ever out there on a low tide on a beautiful sunny day, there are probably a thousand of people out there with you. You know, there's seven school buses in the parking lot and 400 kids running around on the reef. And there's people out there with buckets collecting mussels and urchins and pole fishing for eel. So there's a lot of activity that goes on there. So we're really interested in kind of the influence of this high visitorship and collecting. Um, what we'd like to do is just north of this area is the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, which is um, a reserve that's been protected since the late 1960s. And so what we want to do is expand our monitoring into the reserve as well so we can really kind of compare these two different places. Um, and again, just like the Mount Tumble Pies project, we want to just establish a, a baseline for what's there now so that as we move into the future, we can continue to monitor change. Uh, and very similar to what we're doing on Mount Tumble Pies, we're documenting species, again, with our GPS-enabled cameras. Luckily, they're also waterproof, so they work really well in the inner tidal. Um, we're taking down information on data sheets. That information gets put together in iNaturalist, which is kind of an obser uh, natural observation gathering um, website. So again, those photos and those, that data stay together. Um, we're not taking nearly as many specimens from the area just because we don't really need them. We are, though, taking specimens um, like two feet of sea stars so we can do some population genetics over time to see if there's any shift in the populations out on, out, out on a pillar point. And again, this is um, a really interesting place for us to work, not only because we have historical specimens and not only because the Gulf of the Farallons has uh, management questions, um, but if you've ever been tide pooling, you've probably no noticed that you have a really high biodiversity in a very small area. You know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of species out there on the reef. Um, and intertidal species, they tend to be bound in this very small livable range. You know, they can't extend lower in the intertidal, they can't go higher in the intertidal, and that usually has to do with either environmental factors or competition or predation, but there's, you know, basically they usually have very small band in the inner tidal that they can live, which means that as we start to see changes due to water temperature or increasing air temperatures or anything like that, the inner tidal is one of those places where we might see some of the first um, real changes due to climate change, as things have to move upwards or downwards um, because it's such a small area that they are able to live in. You know, versus the side of a mountain, for example, where small shifts are going to be hard to see. You can see small shifts in the inner tidal. But most intertidal organisms have pelagic larval stages, so their larvae are released into the ocean, so they actually do have the ability to expand their range pretty quickly because their larvae are swimming out there, and if they find a suitable habitat to settle in, that can become a new part of the range if they hadn't been there before. Um, so we have a lot of nudibranch researchers at the academy, so my example is from nudibranchs. Um, there's definitely a few species that, even just 20 years ago, were found basically from mid-Baja California and south, which in the last 20 years have expanded up to Point Conception. And even more focused in the Bay Area, um, this is a species of nudibranch that preys on other species of nudibranchs. And it used to only be found from Monterey Bay south. But just in the last 40 years, it's made its way up the coast and actually across the bay into Marin. And the folks who study these communities have actually noticed changes in the communities of nudibranchs because this one that 
for dates on other nudibranchs is now in the area. So again, there's a really kind of great area to study biodiversity changes and to ask interesting questions. So what I don't have is a bunch of great data analysis and results to show you because we just finished our field seasons. Um, and so we actually haven't yet gone back into the historical records to see what's different and what's there now that wasn't there in the past and things like that. Um, but we do feel like we've made a lot of progress. Here, we're getting to the data analysis part. Um, like I mentioned with the marine use of water, we our test case up on Mount Tamalpais. We've had four field days this year, and those were four days. People came out with us recently eight hours a day. Um, in those four days, we were able to make more than 650 observations, comprising about 350 species of plants, which is actually really great, because this year we only worked in one-third of the watershed. And so with 900 known species, we've already cataloged over a third of the known species there. So we're hoping over the next couple of years, as we move into the other two-thirds of the watershed, we'll be able to capture those other two-thirds of the species. Um, we also collected more than 450 specimens for our research collections at the Academy, which is great to do in four days. Um, and we had about 80 volunteers participate with us this year. Cheryl included. <laughs> um, our test case at the Pillar Point Reef, we've had five field days this year. Um, two of them were actually just last week. Uh, three of them before that were at five in the morning in the middle of June, <laughs> early, early field days. We also have a few more coming up um, in just a few weeks, actually. Um, and so we've made more than 500 observations. We've documented close to 200 species um, at the reef as well. Um, like I said, we're not collecting as many specimens, but we have collected some to do genetic work in the future, which is great. Um, we've had about 60 people come and um, help us out at Florida Point. So even though we don't yet have a bunch of um, great results to show, um, we are uh, trying to get our data out to a wider audience. So by entering our observations on Calflora and iNaturalist, those automatically get fed to a larger pool of people who might be interested in you know, what plants occur in California, um, or they're just in specific invasives, things like that. So we're already getting the data out to a wider audience. Um, iNaturalist especially, if you've ever used it when you upload an observation, um, once it becomes research grade, which means it's a pretty your observation, um, that, the, those data actually get fed out to um, the Encyclopedia of Life, to GBIF, um, if they're California plants, they actually get fed into Calflora. So we're actually getting our data out to a pretty large audience. Um, we've also, kind of started our species list for Pillar Point. Kind of hard to see from here, but basically this is just a map of Pillar Point and all the places that we've documented species. So we're really getting kind of working on that comprehensive survey of the reef. Um, and with our herbarium specimens, I sometimes get the question of, well, if you have a herbarium specimen for Mount Tam with other species, like for a poppy, for example, why do you need another one? So here are two poppies. This one was collected by Alice Eastwood in the late 1800s. This was collected by our group of volunteers. They're both fine specimens. The thing is, though, it's hard to see, but Alice Eastwood's label says Mount Tamalpais. <laughs> That's the only information we have, that she was on Mount Tamalpais when she collected it, um, which doesn't really help us work you know, to know really where that was and does it still occur there today. Um, and so by having our volunteers go out and have this GPS, you know, their locations, they're collecting habitat information, they're collecting abundance of plants, and that information as well, they're really just providing a more comprehensive um, data set as to where things occur. Yeah, yeah. You made an interesting comment, which was uh, before the data gets uploaded, it, there was some validation step. Oh, for iNaturalist? Yeah. Yeah, so iNaturalist is open to anyone to um, upload observations of the natural world. And so when you, you know, you can take a photo with your phone or a camera, when you enter it in, you can say, I think it's this, or I don't know what it is at all. But what it needs is it needs a couple other people to agree on what that thing is. So you can say, you know, this is a poppy, and if someone else goes in and says, yes, I agree, that is a poppy, it's now, and as long as there's location information, date that you took it, where you were, that sort of stuff, it becomes research grade. And so, so that validation is done by other volunteers or by a, a someone in the field? Uh, other volunteers, but also iNaturalist has a very, a pretty decent pool of kind of experts who use it as well. So kind of a, a series of both.
through places that might, you know, might have volunteers already that might have an interest in what we're doing, or maybe we've collected data already in other projects, or maybe we've volunteered with us in other capacities. And so we got a lot of our volunteers through the academy, through the water district, and through the Gulf of Farallons. Um, we also put out calls to local organizations, the plant society, friends groups like the Friends of Fitzgerald Marine Reserve, they have a whole big dosing program um, that we were able to get a lot of volunteers from, park districts, things like that. Um, we contacted a lot of professors at local colleges, you know, people who teach botany or ecology or conservation biology, asking if they have grad students who are interested or undergrads who might want to come out with us. Um, Meetup.com has a great conservation photography group, a local conservation photography group that offers us field trips with the academy. Um, so we were able to get them to come out and help us do some really nice photos out in the field and also people actually doing the work. Um, and then we did have some volunteers just word of mouth, like academy staff who heard about it or friends of the volunteers. And the nice thing is because we have this pool of volunteers that already, you know, we did train them, but who kind of already knew what was going on. They stayed with us for most of our volunteers actually came out to most of our field dates. So it was really easy to kind of insert these novice volunteers into groups. Um, say, you know, here, a few of these people have done this before, they know what they're doing, you know, they'll, they'll train you. So it made it really easy for us. Um, and the really nice thing, too, is that we were able to use volunteers as experts. This is a really self-selecting group. We had a lot of people who really, like, for example, on Mount Tamil Fires, we had a lot of people who knew their plant species who volunteered for this project. And so we didn't actually have to have academy scientists out there, you know, every single group collecting plants. We were able to take these people who wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be considered, you know, professional scientists or not yet, um, and put them as experts in the group. And for example, Cheryl was one of our experts, which was great to have. But we had people from um, the Native Plant Society or local college professors who volunteered to come out with us, and we were able to use them as our experts. Um, the demographics of our volunteers really reflect the fact that we had this targeted um, <laughs> recruitment. You know, the fact that half of them have graduate degrees and 70% of them have already done scientific data collection before. Uh, which was great. This was a wonderful group of volunteers to work with. But as we move forward, we're looking at expanding our field and getting a more diverse audience um, of volunteers involved in our projects. Um, and we've done some evaluation with our volunteers. And the great thing is, is that uh, this information we're getting from our volunteers is what we see in citizen science projects all over the place. That the number one reason that people like to do this, why they come and volunteer with us, is that they want to contribute to scientific research. So, you know, you have this like willing pool of people out there who want to help. They want their, you know, their contribution to go to something larger, which is really important to them. Um, we gave them multiple options to choose from, which is why there's more than 100% there. But they really wanted to contribute to scientific research, which is important. Um, and this is also reflected in this question, you know, how important is it to you to actually see the results? Um, and nobody, not a single person said it wasn't important to them. They all had some degree of importance they wanted to see where their data were going, what they are contributing to. Um, and you can see these results, any, any citizen science project that does analysis of their volunteers are gonna come up with these results as well. So people really do want to help and contribute to science. You know, they're not out there just because they love being outside, although that's one of the reasons they like being out there too. <laughs> so moving just a little bit away from our test cases, I just wanna talk briefly about um, these meetings that we had at the Academy this year. So I said that you know we also wanted to make sure we were learning from other people. We didn't want to reinvent the field. There's all these other citizen science projects out there. Let's hear what other people have learned. Let's you know learn from them. Let's not make the same mistakes. Um, so we had three days of meetings in May. We invited folks basically who run citizen science projects, um, people who do kind of this large scale biodiversity research. And it didn't really matter to us if they worked with citizen scientists or not. We really wanted to get their perspective in general. Uh, we invited local conservation organizations you know, because we want to have these conservation outcomes, we needed to hear from um, our local organizations as to what their management questions are, and then what are their um, like restrictions on data gathered by volunteers. Some, some of them do, you know, they have, they have to use it in a different way. Um, we invited data managers, a lot of citizen science projects, that's where they hit their wall, they gather all this data, and then they don't know what to do with it, they don't have any way to manage it. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we were kind of thinking about that early on. Um, and then we also invited citizen scientists, people who already volunteer in other projects and wanted to hear from them, what keeps them interested, what makes them excited, what keeps them you know, um, engaged in their project over time. And so the goals, again, the first one was very selfish on our part, like tell us what mistakes you've made, but we're not gonna make them. Um, and then let's talk about best practices in biodiversity research, you know, using citizen scientists. 
And then we really wanted these groups to kind of network together. We invited a lot of local groups, a lot of people throughout California, and then we also had people from around the United States coming as well. So we might as well network and talk about how we can help each other and where are the gaps and things like that. And so um, our topics, we had a different topic each day. The first one was just working with your volunteers. The second one was balancing those research and conservation goals with the needs of your participants. You, know, you can't make it so complicated that your participants get turned off and they're not excited, but you can't make it so simple that you're not getting the data that you need. So we talked about how you balance those two things. Um, and then our third day was talking about just using technology and how to manage data and things like that. And so we had a lot of really great talks and presentations from people, but then we would spend our afternoons just working in small groups and talking about, okay, what's worked and what hasn't worked for you in a variety of different topics, you know, managing volunteers or data quality control and assurance. And so we got a lot of great information from a whole bunch of folks. And if you're interested, we have the proceedings available from these meetings. It's this beautiful, like, 60-page document about all the great talks we had, all the things that we learned from it, um, and it's available off of our citizen science website. So, moving forward, what's next? Um, so like I said, this is the end of our year of planning. We've got to start thinking about writing our next round of grant proposals. Um, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to expand our current projects, that Mount Tam project and the Pillar Point project. We liked how they turned out this year, these kind of test cases that we had. We'd like to expand them, get more people involved, have more field dates, things like that. And we really want to start thinking about how we can add in some of the goals that we didn't initially cover. Like that tiered involvement, for example. This year, if you wanted to volunteer with us, you pretty much had to commit to either an eight-hour field day on Mount Tom Ohio's or five in the morning at the Pillar Point Reef and spend you know, four hours with us out there. So it's a very self-selecting group of volunteers that want to do that. <laughs> so we want to really start thinking about how can we get people involved who maybe don't want that level of commitment, but who still want to contribute. Um, again, with the multiple entry points, we did a lot of data gathering this year. We did have some folks who weren't interested in that, so they helped us mount our herbarium specimens, which is great. We want to think about other ways we can get people involved in the scientific process. Um, and also thinking more about technology. Uh, we learned really quickly that people actually, our volunteers were not excited about using their smartphones for data gathering. They actually prefer data sheets and cameras. And so we're looking at other ways, okay, that doesn't seem to work, or maybe like a younger audience might be more interested in that. So mm -hmm. we're still kind of thinking about that. Um, we also like to create new projects. Um, we're really excited about doing something in San Francisco, you know, to involve more of our local community, folks who don't necessarily have cars to get themselves from out to Ohio to Pillar Point. We still want them to be able to contribute. We have all these wonderful historical specimens from San Francisco, you know, places that don't even exist anymore, like the U.S. Marine Hospital Cemetery, the Laurel Hill Cemetery, those places don't exist. It'd be really interesting to see what's there now. Uh, Baby Hills, some of the hills have been developed on, some of them are still there. San Bruno Hill, San Bruno Mountain was protected, so maybe a lot of the previous biodiversity is still there. Um, and there's places like the Cliff House, which probably since this specimen was collected, I think it's burned down twice since then, but it's still a very, um, like it's a very touristy area even back then and now today as well. And so it'd be really interesting to see how things have changed over time. So we're really interested in starting to think about what San Francisco used to look like and how that's reflected today. Um, and then we're also getting data analysis that's coming up. This winter we finally have a few, few months of that field days. So we'll start working on that. Um, we're going to continue our evaluation, make sure our participants are happy and that we're meeting our goals. We'd love to add a citizen science component to the public floor of the academy so people, as they come in to the academy can learn about citizen science and how they can get involved. Um, and then in the future, we're really interested in kind of starting to network with other citizen science projects and you know, what are our data sets when we put them together? What does that tell us about what's going on in California? Um, and then also with other science centers. Do you have any other science centers involved in kind of going out and re-documenting biodiversity in their area? And then we'd love to go national or international eventually. So, with that, I will take questions. <laughs>
combining the education and the research realms of the academy together um, can also be challenging just because everyone's so busy. <laughs> it's hard to get people all together in one room to really think about this in like a cohesive manner. So do you do you have a, a staff or you said it was just you? So it's basically just me. Um, okay. The oh, idea wow. is that we will be hiring people starting this coming year. Okay. Um, as we expand our projects, we're hoping to hire probably at least two more full time people. So all of the, the planning and, and the, the meetings and everything, that was you were having people come in from different departments in the academy? Yeah, so basically I have, I have a couple folks on the research side, a couple folks on the education side. You know, I, I call them like my thinkers, okay. but they're totally willing to sit down and help me think through projects, but then the actual implementation was really like left to me to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wondering, um, how do you guys plan on like recruiting more citizen scientists? Like what is your course of action for getting that more diversity that you want in your um, Yeah, well, I think, so what we're doing right now, like for example with our intertidal project, what we've done, what we were doing last week, what we're gonna do in November, is we're really looking at designing a protocol that people can do without, you know, a scientist there with them to help them along. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at something that people could eventually, um, you know, see the protocols on the website, you know, really easy steps to follow. They can go out, take their data, submitted to us online, and that could be their contributions. They wouldn't actually have to spend a whole day with us if they didn't want to. Um, and I think a big part of that, too, is going to be really developing something in San Francisco. Because right now, we're really, we're really limited to people who can get themselves to the San Mateo coast or up to Mount Telepias. So we know in San Francisco, a lot of people just don't have that capability. Um, so we're really hoping to engage some, we're really, what we would really like to do with that, sign, that San Francisco project is, you know, in your own backyard. Just tell us, you know, where you are, what's in your backyard? What's in, you know, the park across your street? things like that. Do you really kind of get people to think locally about what's going on? And then if they want to come and volunteer on a larger project, then they can come and spend a whole day with us if they wanted to.